Are you happy for us to start? Fantastic. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure indeed, both as director of the East-West Institute and as founder chairman of the Arab International Women's Forum to chair and moderate the second plenary session of our conference. Our title is New Directions for Water, Energy, Food, Security Policies in Southwest Asia and the Middle East. As an Arab with three roots in the region, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine, while a UK citizen, and as a development economist, I fully comprehend and acknowledge the importance and the seriousness of these issues of access to resources, water, food, and energy, which are absolutely vital for economic growth and development, and with it, security and stability in our region. It's indeed a great privilege to welcome on this panel five most distinguished and accomplished guest speakers. Dr. Riza Ardakanyan, Director, United Nations Water Decade Program on Capacity Development. Her Excellency Ambassador Mara Marinaki, the Managing Director, Global and Multilateral Issues European External Action Service. His Excellency Mohammed Yahya Maroufi, Secretary General of the Economic Co Cooperation Organization. Dr. Khalid Malik, Head of the Human Development Report at the UNDP. And Dr. Gianluigi Magri, the Under Secretary of State, Ministry of Defense in Italy. Our guest speakers come from Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Italy, and Greece. They have all covered a wide arena of expertise and responsibility in their long and successful careers in both the public and private sectors, and will indeed make a substantial contribution to this important session. Our main objective in this plenary is to build on the findings expertly presented in plenary session one and explore and present recommendations or proposals on new directions of tackling the water, food, energy issues and concerns, and addressing these issues in order to safeguard and sustain the economic and regional order in Southwest Asia and in the Middle East. The questions to address are the following. What are the biggest risks to regional security associated with food, water, and energy? What are the opportunities and the benefits of a regional approach to cooperating on these issues? What is the potential for water, energy, food nexus interlinked approach in order to stimulate growth and development? How can the public and private sectors cooperate in this endeavor? And what can the international community do to help in this exercise? It gives me great pleasure to commence this session to invite Dr. Riza Arkadanyan to the podium. Dr. Riza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Still, I think, yeah. Good morning to everyone. And I would like to uh, thank uh, East West Institute as well as uh, World Custom Organization for wonderful preparation and arrangement of this uh, conference. And uh, start with uh, uh, our contribution to this very important issue, directions and recommendations for water, energy, food security policies in Southwest Asia and the Middle East. I'm funding director of uh, <clears throat> a program is called UN Water Decade Program, and UN Water is an interagency mechanism inside United Nations. Nowadays, uh, about 28 UN agencies, as well as 25 non UN organi organizations dealing with water, uh, working together uh, as interagency mechanism of UN Water, and our program specifically is in charge of uh, capacity development, both at 
individual and institutional level based in Bonn. And uh, recently also I was appointed as founding director of a new United Nations University Institute in Dresden, Germany. It's called UNU Flores and it, it stands for uh, integrated management of uh, water, waste, and uh, soil as a follow-up to this nexus approach. And you see here that uh, everything comes from, uh, from these uh, uh, global trends that nowadays we are facing. It's uh, increase in urbanization, uh, almost 50% uh, of the whole population living in cities, and I may say about uh, one billion uh, living in the slums around the, around the cities, and also population growth and climate change. These three global trends are affecting uh, Nexus perspective of food security, water supply security, and energy security. And water is uh, a very important cross-cutting issue that connects all these three together. Action fields for this uh, Nexus perspective are society, economy, and environment. Accelerating access, integrating the bottom of the pyramid, as well as creating more with less related to the economy. And another action field is environment, investing to sustain ecosystem services. What we expect out of this approach mainly is a, a nexus thinking. And uh, I uh, heard one of our uh, respected speaker in the uh, earlier session mentioned that this uh, uh, nexus uh, approach is uh, nothing new and uh, all countries are dealing with this, but the point is that we have to highlight this way of thinking and then at the end we hope to expect promotion on water, energy, food security for all as well as equitable, sustainable growth and resilient, productive environment. What uh, I would like to highlight today is that all of us uh, talking about regional cooperation. Some say definition of the region is important. Some others say we have to find uh, action fields for cooperation among uh, countries in the region and so on. But uh, as, a, as a teacher in, in water resources, when I think about uh, this concept, I remember that even in a very simple element of the society in a neighborhood, in a building with some apartments and so on, in, in a street, in, in a village, whatever you like, if you want to recommend for cooperation among the neighbors, there is a pre-request for that. If uh, two families want to work together and help each other and uh, increase the level of cooperation among themselves, there is a pre-request, and that is that inside each family individually, they should respect those values. We cannot find any uh, uh, regional cooperation, any best or success story uh, or good practice of regional cooperation without having this pre-request that the countries at the national level are able to exercise this cooperation. I have some years of experiences uh, working with the government of my own country related to the water issues, and uh, we also achieved some regional cooperation in terms of building large dams on the shared river uh, between Iran and Turkmenistan, uh, reactivating the water treaty between Iran and Afghanistan after 30 years. Uh, building another large dams uh, in, in the, I mean, conflict area between, in the northwest uh, of Iran, uh, connected to, uh, to Azerbaijan and Armenia and so on. But those 
uh, achievements happen after uh, good exercise of, of cooperation at the national level. We cannot expect that uh, a country without uh, good experiences of cooperation between organizations, between uh, sectors uh, related to the water at the national level, they can achieve any kind of progress at the regional level. We may uh, organize conferences, seminars, invite uh, people coming from here and there and provide good uh, declaration and so on, but when they go back home, when we go back home and we want to implement it, we face some difficulties at the national level. So I may say that uh, maybe one of the good uh, lessons learned from this kind of uh, gathering is that we provide uh, uh, successful guidelines uh, to achieve a better level of uh, coordination and cooperation at the national level. Then it paves the way among the countries in the region because when, for example, ministries in charge of water, agriculture, environment, energy, uh, and so on have a, a platform for cooperation at the national level, then they can extend this, uh, this cooperation uh, to the region with the neighboring countries. Or I may say without this, always there is a lack of, uh, a lack of uh, good understanding and so on. So from uh, UN water perspective, I would like to mention that uh, there are some, some good uh, examples. Uh, at uh, at uh, three level, we have uh, uh, we have some experiences uh, helping uh, member states to develop capacities, institutional capacities, as well as uh, some cooperation at the at the regional and international level. And as I mentioned in in this particular case, I may uh, present uh, this interagency mechanism of UN Water. Because even from UN perspective, we cannot uh, recommend uh, member states for better cooperation at the national level without showing them a practical, uh, practical exercise inside the UN system. This uh, interagency mechanism established in 2003-2004 for better cooperation among uh, UN agencies related to the water and then later on, uh, other non-UN organizations also showed interest to join. So now we have more than 60 uh, UN, non-UN organizations uh, and programs working under this, uh, this umbrella of, uh, of UN water. And there are good examples. I may uh, share with you uh, some of them. For example, safe use of wastewater in agriculture. We all know that uh, almost uh, one-seventh of, of the population uh, dealing with this, uh, this challenge of uh, lack of uh, enough uh, safe water and one of the main consumer is, is agriculture sector. Between 80 to 90, even 95 percent of uh, uh, fresh water in arid and semi-arid area uh, uh, are being consumed in, in agriculture with a low efficiency. And always there is an imbalance between supply and demand. So either we have to increase the supply of water or manage the demand. But another way of increasing the supply is using, uh, using wastewater. So uh, to present this concept to, to many countries, we know that uh, first, uh, the ministries and organizations at the national level dealing with this issue should uh, work together, should have a platform for cooperation. So we try to uh, recommend this uh, in a very practical way. So we have started to develop a project among different UN agencies who are dealing with this issue, like FAO, like WHO, UNEP, United Nations University, that all of them have done a lot related to uh, wastewater use in agriculture. WHO from 
health aspect, FAO from food aspect, UNEP from environmental aspect. But we defined a, a joint project among these agencies and then uh, started to invite member states who are interested to join us and see first this practical cooperation among UN agencies and then we asked them to uh, develop a national report related to uh, use of wastewater in agriculture in their own countries. Uh, developing a national report needs that those ministries sit together and talk to each other and share the data, information, and so on with each other. And by this, a platform will be established among the ministries because this issue is not an uh, issue of uh, just one ministry or one organization. National drought management is another issue and uh, water security and so on. So I may say that uh, nowadays, after, especially after uh, Rio plus 20, uh, in, in June this year, uh, we have this, uh, this perspective of uh, post-2015 thematic uh, consultation. 11, uh, 11 uh, thematic area have been identified uh, uh, for, for cooperation and uh, water, uh, food security, and energy are three of them. So, Nexus thinking really is, uh, is an issue, and uh, we should talk about this. We should encourage uh, member states that first at the national level, they try to, to establish any kind of uh, mechanism which is suitable for them related to their national interests and constitution and the structure of the organizations and so on even going beyond that and uh, dealing with the issue at the universities because uh, Nexus thinking also needs uh, later on Nexus teaching. So instead of waiting for products of the university coming, uh, seeing the graduated people who are not dealing with the issue at the bachelor level and so on, and then we start to train them for uh, Nexus approach, it's better that we do something related to the curricular development in the universities and so on. And then we have a new generation of uh, graduated people who understand the concept of Nexus and then they can implement this first at the national level and then as a byproduct of that, automatically we can see a better cooperation at the regional level. So I would like to just emphasize on this particular simple message, uh, taking the advantage of this uh, golden opportunity and saying that uh, regional cooperation needs uh, a very important uh, uh, prerequisite, and that is uh, cooperation at the national level. And this is a good exercise. Without this, we cannot expect uh, really a fruitful cooperation at the regional level. Uh, Southwest Asia and Central Asia have plenty of opportunities. Uh, they have, if we look at them as a region, they have enough water, uh, they have enough land, they have enough uh, human resources, a good market, and what we need is capacity development, both at individual and institutional level. Uh, but uh, first, we have to encourage uh, the member states in that region. We have to help them by providing uh, uh, good uh, guidelines and uh, uh, exercises uh, from uh, the other parts of the world for a better cooperation at the national level. Maybe one example is establishment of somehow a, a nexus uh, council at the, at the national level uh, bringing uh, organizations, ministries uh, related to this concept together uh, and uh, they develop a, a platform for this and then uh, for sure in the near future we may uh, witness a better cooperation at, inter at uh, regional level and uh, at international. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Erdakanyan, indeed, for concrete recommendations and also for showing us how the United Nations is truly leading by example in this field in establishing the coordination amongst the various agencies within the UN to tackle the water issues. It gives me great pleasure now to invite Her Excellency Ambassador Mara Marinaki to address us, please. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Alkayani, and uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is a special pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I would like to thank uh, the East-West Institute uh, for uh, inviting me to take uh, part in this uh, prestigious uh, and traditional now event, which has been gaining in importance and participation as time passes. And also, I would like to thank uh, the World Customs Organization for their hospitality. Our session today focuses on uh, the nexus between water, energy, and food security. Um, which throughout history and all over the world has been a matter of war and peace. Uh, from the part of the European Union, I would like to reiterate uh, that uh, for, uh, uh, for all of us, uh, this uh, nexus in Southwest Asia and in the Middle East uh, is also now a critical triangle for peace, stability, and prosperity. It uh, presents formidable challenges in terms of supply, cooperation, sustainable development, and modernization. I would like first uh, to identify the challenges a little more clearly. We are fully aware that uh, these issues have potentially far-reaching implications for the peace, the stability, and the prosperity around the world. Uh, and we may even call them the cardinal 21st century security challenges. The first challenge is about adequate supply of water for human consumption, energy generation, and agriculture. Demand often outstrips supply needs are rising, and the current situation in many places in the region is deemed as unsustainable. Therefore, this challenge is about scarcity. The second challenge is that the region has uh, very few water courses which serve uh, larger areas of land uh, belonging to several nations. And these transboundary challenges often lack comprehensive collaborative and sustainable management arrangements. Therefore, this challenge is about regional cooperation. The third challenge is the transition of the region away from the traditional dependency on hydrocarbons and towards sustainable energy policies, such as the investment on renewable and energy efficiency. This challenge is about sustainable development. And finally, there is a related, more concrete challenge about modernization of agriculture along sustainable lines. For example, in order to reduce excessive consumption of already scarce water resources for agriculture. Therefore, the nexus of water, energy, and food security presents formidable challenges in terms of um, supply, cooperation, sustainable development and modernization. And if supply and scarcity are above all risks, cooperation and sustainable development and modernization are mostly opportunities if they're handled properly. To start with water, it is by far the single most important issue in understanding that the, the social and human impact of climate change, such as widespread shortage of water, reduction of Arab land, water pollution, increased flooding, and prolonged droughts uh, are really a danger. Demographic shifts uh, are also very important. 
we estimate that uh, by 2025, the global population is projected to increase to 8.1 billion, and projections indicate that over the next decade, the number of people living in water-stressed countries and regions will increase uh, to 3 billion. That is a six-fold increase. Inequalities are also often critical in the relations between upstream and downstream countries. And there is uh, plenty of examples in the regions that we are discussing and all of us are aware. The European Union is unique in the wide range that we can cover. In our comprehensive approach, we can bring together diplomacy, security, development, humanitarian assistance and human rights. Dealing with global issues in a comprehensive and joined up way is increasingly necessary in a world where the internal and the external issues are so closely intertwined and where borders are porous, information moves with the speed of light, and political, social, and economic interaction are global. The High Representative and Vice President of the European Commission, Ms. Cathy Ashton, has prioritized the need to engage in new ways and on horizontal and not just geographical issues to deal with these problems. Climate change, energy, water and education have therefore already been discussed by the foreign ministers of the European Union member states in their ministerial councils. And this is also why, on the first day of the general debate of the last, uh, of the uh, current, rather, 67th United Nations General Assembly in September in New York, uh, High Representative Ashton and uh, Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Hillary Clinton, have joined forces, together with UN Water, on moving toward the crucial issue of water security on the international agenda. Both High Representative Ashton and Secretary of State Clinton have acknowledged the risks and opportunities associated with increased water stress all over the world, mindful of their growing political implications, and they also highlighted the cross-cutting nature of water issues and its interlinkages with sustainable development, development cooperation, human rights, peace, and security. They committed together and with the United Nations to step up their engagement and target concrete operational objectives on water security issues and the various dimensions that those encompass. The European Union has a long and substantive commitment on water through our development cooperation assistance, more recently particularly in the context of the Millennium Development Goals, where we have spent uh, already 2 billion euros in 60 countries since 2008 in support of water and sanitation investments. We're also fully supportive of the process after the Rio Plus 20 summit and the importance which is attached to water in its context where access to water was reaffirmed in Rio in June as a human right. We remain committed to continuing our efforts to promote collaborative and sustainable water management arrangements in transboundary river basins and other shared water resources across the world. We see this as a tangible conflict prevention contribution and we will seek to enhance our partnerships in this area to this regard. The European Union is, in these efforts is also inspired by our own experiences and the expertise acquired in areas by member states, such, such as is the case with the Danube River. Such efforts, we believe, can be further complemented by supporting existing international instruments, such as the 1992 and 1997 Water Conventions, where more states around the globe should adhere at the earliest possible. But the challenges on water, energy, and food security are indeed complex. 
and they also raise issues of investment to sustainable energy solutions and to modernization of relevant industries. Again, in these efforts, we are inspired by progress at home and by some of our wider European Union policy choices, such as our climate change policies, which we believe uh, should be the right way ahead in tackling these challenges. In Europe, with our 2020-20 initiative, that is 20% renewable energy in our energy mix, a 20% improvement in energy efficiency, and a 20% cut in greenhouse gases, all by 2020, and now transformed into binding legislation. Well, we believe with this that we are moving ahead in the right direction. But the European Union is also fully behind efforts to support sustainable energy access around the world, where all major proponents of the United Nations-led Sustainable Energy for All initiative, uh, and we look forward to closer interaction in support of the Secretary General of the United Nations. To conclude, our approach to the water, energy, and food security challenges globally, and also in the Middle East and Southwest Asia, is guided by our efforts to promote regional cooperation and collaborative solutions by investing in sustainable development and by promoting modernization of relevant industries. Ultimately, when it comes to the challenges of water, energy, and food security, our cooperation and partnership is very much about how to identify win-win solutions. And we believe that the momentous political changes in the region now provide an opportunity to take this cooperation a step further. And we look forward to join forces with everybody in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Marinaki, for giving us, again, the concrete steps taken by the EU in implementing and in tackling this important food, energy, and water nexus. Thank you, indeed. It gives me great pleasure now to invite His Excellency Mohammed Yahya Marufi to address us, and please, you're very welcome. Thank you, Madam. Chairperson, for giving me the floor. Um, before I turn to the subject matter, let me express uh, my profound thanks for the organizers of this meeting. who have been quite initiative in uh, their um, experience of the one I participated last and this one. Uh, to identify areas of, um, uh, of uh, common interest in terms of reaching peace and security. So I guess this is a great pleasure for me to be here to participate in this August <laughs> gathering. The second point, I would like to also appreciate those who spoke before me uh, in uh, such a uh, thought-provoking um, uh, manner uh, to give us a, a good understanding of what exactly are we talking about. I'm particularly um, impressed by the Tour de Horizon, the uh, Tour de Horizon of uh, President Atisari, who uh, laid the um, various aspect uh, of this exercise uh, so clearly um, and thought-provokingly that when we leave here, that's a point that we, we should uh, continue uh, to think about, because this will keep coming up and up. Also, the other participants, each participant um, started to uh, identify various areas and the ways and means of how this cooperation could be built into a viable um, uh, cooperation for assuring uh, peace and security in, in the region and in the world. Um, when I was invited to this meeting, um, 
uh, I received the invitation on the last day of my uh, responsibility as Secretary General of Economic Cooperation Organization. And when I came here, I became Minister, Advisor to the President on International Relations, which uh, the office I have not yet assumed, so I'm not here, not there. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here that I had this opportunity to participate. Um, the subject, as uh, has been discussed, is, is vast and it needs a lot of uh, uh, thinking and, and uh, whatever you say, you, you could be relevant in, uh, um, from whatever aspect. But I think for me the way out is just I concentrate on the points, the questions that are here. I think this is a, a, a very good practice that now it makes it easier to avoid many of the repetitions or things that you uh, uh, say and, and the others will have to listen to it again and again. I think here the questions are, are very straightforward. And I will go by the order of the of the questions that are posed here. The first question is, of course, the risks. Um, first, we have to address this uh, nexus of, of water, food, and, uh, uh, and energy. And my focus will be from my experience in the ECHO as Secretary General uh, to share that with you. Uh, the risks, um, of course, um, are there. Uh, because with water and food and all that, you need a, a mental change. You need uh, a confidence building. Uh, as it said, you know, the, uh, uh, the security starts from the stomach of individuals. You know, if he is fed well, and if he has food, water and all that, he might be calmed down. You know, so he's not going to go out for any uh, fireworking. Uh, so that is the big, and, and they, he will share it uh, uh, whenever he is convinced that he gets something for it. Now here we see the question of, um, uh, and then of course to, to move from that stage to community stage and then to the regional stage and to the global stage. Um, I will give you two examples uh, so that you can see the risk. Water in many, as uh, the great lady has uh, just mentioned, uh, is something a source of conflict as well. Uh, because many in the history people uh, started um, creating conflict on water sharing, on benefits of water, on even sharing with the, uh, with the neighbors was the most important um, difficulty, how, how you can convince somebody to give them a little bit more water than than yourself. Uh, so that there is a potential conflict of water sharing and food sharing and energy, unless you have enough to share. Um, so that mental change is very much needed. Um, in the old days, before what happened in Afghanistan, we had a prime minister who made a very uh, human gesture to a neighbor country which was in need of water. And he very kindly, out of his kindness and, and neighborliness and out of his compassion, uh, have agreed uh, to give a little more, more water to one of our neighbor countries than what was agreed. That prime minister was almost impeached. And he had such a tough time. He was the most brilliant prime minister we had, but he had a very tough time as well, just simply because why he made that just to give the water to the neighbor. So that is, that's one thing. The second one, at the ecosystem, when we started to concentrate on uh, building a water management or establishing an, uh, uh, a Water Management Institute related to one of the specialized agencies of ECHO in Islamabad, um, we had almost a crisis on hand because the 10 member countries uh, of ECHO, they thought that we are suddenly entering into a business of solving conflict between the countries, which was not our intention and we couldn't do it either. Anyway, 
And this took a long time and a long delay to convince uh, some of the member countries that there is no intention of uh, sharing or solving your conflict of water or we're entering in any conflict uh, area of, of solving water conflicts. Uh, but the point was that we need to manage the water uh, in a um, geographic uh, um, encadrement uh, or in, in a, on the national scene. Um, that is uh, what is um, uh, what was our intention. So we finally succeeded to convince that the water management is not that solving the question. Water management is that there are countries who has water and maybe sufficient water, and they may not be dependent on any other country, or to go for it and fight or create a conflict if they can manage their water themselves properly. That was also when in my uh, previous uh, assignment as advisor to the president, it was the same thing. Um, the, in the cabinet, we had various ministers who were complaining, uh, we don't have water, 30 years, and, and of course we were coming out of 10 years of drought. And there's, everybody was saying, where is, where we have water shortage. And the president was so much pushed that he had to make a decision to form a commission to go and, and, and uh, find out uh, how much shortage of water. Um, surprisingly, that uh, the, the outcome and the conclusion of that uh, commission was that we are not as that, uh, that much short, you know, to create, to ring an alarm. But the point is that there is lack of management. And I think this is it. Um, uh, there are pressures, of course, there are uh, uh, consciousness more uh, you, you want to develop, you want to sustain, you want to have uh, security, and all this you can have when you have management of your resources. May it be water, may it be food, may it be uh, seeds, all of that. So um, that is the, the fact is that is always, uh, the question is always there. And it is now, as we saw it, uh, there is on the question not only on the individuals, uh, but it's in the mind of the international organization, in the mind of regional organization, the mind of individuals, and how to put all these uh, dynamics together to get a proper, um, you know, proper solutions and, and cooperation. Um, so with this, um, I say that ECHO has started to, uh, uh, to take uh, a lead after the big decision was made at the summit level in FAO or in uh, uh, other rounds of, of uh, international discussions on water uh, management and uh, to see what we should do. And uh, that's why in ECHO we have established this uh, with, to which I referred uh, this institute, which is uh, three institute, number one is the management of water in Islamabad, uh, and is doing well uh, because the the statute is uh, approved by the ten member states, um, and you all know that there are potential conflicts, and those conflicts are very sort of uh, uh, contagious, and but they are there. And despite all those potential conflicts, we have been able to convince that there is a need of water management uh, institution. The other two exercises was also the food security, uh, and that the food security became so much important that we had to convince the member states that they divided between the agriculture and the eco -weco. Uh, Agriculture is the Agriculture Institute, which is now in Ankara, and the other one was in Iran, which is the um, veterinary uh, uh, project. It, it became so much uh, um, important that we had to go to the higher level of taking the proper decisions to divide these two between the two countries. So that's also a reality. It exists there. It has a board. It has a, uh, a, a statute which is approved by the member state. Um, then, of course, we have the um, 
this is the question that I refer to as, um, as the risks. Uh, you can stop, Madam, whenever I am in access. Mm -hmm. I can speed up. Perhaps another five minutes. Okay, so the, the other one is the potentials. Of course, the potentials, there is the region um, of, of Central uh, of Asia plus the South Asia uh, is, is very rich in terms of resources, in terms of gas, petrol, energy, and all that, in terms of human resources. Uh, you have uh, 400, almost half a billion population, which is a very big potential. And then you have gas and almost half of the world resources in, in that area, if you consider also the uh, Kazakhstan and the new resources, and Tajikistan is now identified as to be one of the huge resources of gas and petrol, Afghanistan for that reason. Uh, and then of course, Iran is a traditional source of that. If you stretch it a little bit more, this is almost more than perhaps half of the term. And the need for energy is also there. You have big countries, I'm not going to that. Uh, we have enormous big countries that are now there uh, on the way of a very advanced uh, technology, advanced uh, progress that are in need of energy. So there is also a market. There is a source and there is market. And what is needed, how to put this together in a way that could be useful for those who are so needs progress. Uh, to share technology, to share uh, experience, to share uh, the know-how. Uh, and that is the political will. Uh, I think that the political will is also emerging. Uh, from my experience, from beginning, starting with this work, I, started, I ended up with having some satisfaction that there is a, a strong awareness and we hope that there will be some political um, a political hard decision to, to make. Um, the, uh, so with this, um, that the energy, petrol, solar, human technology, water, all gas with, with the availability of this, what we need is to share resources, uh, to share know-how, to share experience, to identify areas of cooperation uh, uh, on less contagious issues, uh, how, how to deal with this very through the diplomatic, uh, uh, intricate diplomatic uh, uh, means to create a dialogue on a, on a broader basis of, uh, uh, of our uh, region. Uh, the role of international organization is very important. Uh, we in our, uh, in, in ECHO, we have been able to get benefit from IDB funds, from uh, Asian Development Bank from the OIC funds. There are funds available. And so if these funds are only thing to develop these mechanisms that are already in place to work, uh, that also needs hard decisions. You know, we say it, but I'm not very pleased with many of international organizations by just saying, you know, that we are doing it. I see less in the ground. Uh, and on the ground, we need a more to work. If this is identified to be peace and security, then we have to work hand in hand and really make sure that things are happening. Uh, that, is, that is a very important question. Uh, not go from one meeting to the other with no results. And I think if this is the, the decision conclusion of this conference, that it's an important issue, then let's everybody pledge that we go after it and we do it. Um, WFP, FAO, and all that. Now, the other funding agencies also we have to use, there are various funding agencies. I'm not speaking only, I'm, I start speaking on the region, but I, this is, there are a lot of synergies that you can use for other agencies, for other regions, you know, on the global scene. And then, of course, the public sector is the very important. We have to start with the very strong public sector, and that's the government to start the public sector. Uh, would you believe it in Afghanistan, my colleague minister is here, we don't have even a public buses. I mean, this is, this is something that we have to share it uh, with, in the region with our friends, that these are the needs. If you don't have public buses, how do you take four million population of Kabul from one end to the other uh, four times, five times a day? This is a need, you know, this, is, this need uh, a regional cooperation, there is energy, there are technology, and why, 
we, we don't get that, so we can put it together. And then, of course, the most last point, Madam, if you allow me, I would like to refer to the private sector. I think the private sector is also very, very important. I am pleased that there are now some momentum in our region taking place. There has been two important conferences. One is, I guess, now taking place in, in, in Bombay with the president there, and of course there was another one in New Delhi uh, to where the Indian uh, government very kindly invited the private sector to come and to invest. And I think that is, that is also, if we make this, if we make the, the, the right choices and get the right political uh, momentum going on and, and the, the, the um, mechanism in place, the private sector is there to benefit. Uh, um, the private sector is not only selling potatoes, you know, they can come and do something more viable, uh, more interesting for them and, and for the countries. With these few words, thank you very much, Madam, for giving me the floor. Thank I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, indeed, for sharing with us uh, live examples of uh, some of the important issues that we you are addressing in, in, in your region, and we are addressing at this conference, especially relating to water management. Uh, we also wish you every good success in your new role as advisor to the president on all these important uh, issues. It gives me great pleasure now to invite Dr. Khalid Malik to kindly take the floor. So you, and okay, and you and you will. I, I just press it. Okay. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, like others, let me just start by thanking the East Wales Institute for inviting me and uh, also for the World Customs Organization for hosting this uh, uh, this conference in this wonderful building. It is quite interesting to be in a security conference because you're trying to figure out what to say exactly, which is of value and interest, and has a certain um, aspect which people can think about. So I thought, uh, since the current job I'm doing is to head the Human Development Port Office, that I could do, do it from a human development perspective. As uh, some of you might know, and I hope all of you might know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, very enterprising, distinguished uh, Pakistani, Dr. Mahbubul Haq, in close partnership with the Indian uh, economist uh, Amartya Sen, also Nobel laureate, really advanced human development thinking in a very profound way. And this uh, also relates to security. Can we do next? So let me start by looking at the notion of security itself. I think. Uh, in 1994, and I'll urge people to actually look at that global report, uh, uh, Mahbub introduced the notion of human security and trying to emphasize, in some ways, the debates on water, energy, all are coming to that particular aspect, not fully there, but coming to it. And trying to, he advocated this idea that security needs, we have to shift it from a territorial, militaristic state guarding of state borders to the reduction of insecurity in people's lives. And there's a very fundamental paradigm shift. And if you look at that, many other things fall into place. So we have to find a way to focus on people and people's capabilities. And the way it, human security was defined was a universal quest for freedom from want, which is your basic needs, water, energy, but food, and freedom from fear. And these two are the principal building blocks in any thinking on security. Because it's security has to be fundamentally connected to individuals and people. And maybe it's a, the notion of states and states' uh, uh, systems have somehow clouded one's approach in that sense. Let me also highlight another point, which is look at, OK, I have to do more of this, sorry. Uh, it's an interesting um, um, graph here. And if you look at it historically since 1990, there's, there's good news. Uh, countries generally are spending less money on uh, defense expenditures. And that's the good news. The less good news is the last few years, some countries, 
and we can say particularly in our, the region we're talking about, military expenditures are on the rise. And that is something one has to think very carefully about. It does not add to security, by the way. And that's all the work done, certainly in, in, in the office I'm leading, but also elsewhere. Uh, more arms, more guns, more weapons do not constitute better security. And then there's the other example. There are 20 plus countries which have virtually no armies or very small security apparatus, of course, led by Costa Rica, which uh, some few decades ago decided not to have any army at all. And this is in a region in Central America which was prone to a lot of destabilization and, and disagreement. Now this is a, I thought uh, we could start with a quote. By the way, uh, another report uh, people could look at is the really very good report uh, on water, which was in 2006, which is produced by the Human Development Report Office. And it, has a, it takes a quote from Mark Twain, it's a whiskey for drinking and water is for fighting over. Actually, it wasn't quite correct. If you look at the historical record, no war has been fought over water. This may surprise a lot of people. And when states go to war, then traditionally it's over something far less important than water. And this is uh, quite an interesting uh, perspective to think of water in that way. Much of what we think is national water is in fact shared water, there's transboundary, which becomes a huge opportunity for partnership, for improving people's lives and reducing the insecurities people experience in their day-to-day -day lives. So non-cooperation, lack of cooperation, lack of coming together, contributes to walk to security which has huge impacts on livelihoods, health and well-being. Just the ability of people to move around is affected. And as I said, military conflict is rare, but we have to somehow dig between, dig deeper on these matters and figure out why is it that the shared cooperation and shared water management is not moving as rapidly as it should be. I had some uh, direct experience of this when I was a UN representative in Central Asia a few decades ago uh, in, in Uzbekistan. We set up a, a, actually a convention which all the uh, five uh, leaders signed on sustainable development. But I could see even then how difficult it was for people to talk to each other. These are the same people who had grown up together but somehow in more national boundaries it became more difficult. I'm going to touch upon some of the other areas in a similar vein and then try to perhaps bring it together. Uh, last year's report, the 2011 report, is about environment and sustainability. And it makes a very profound, important point that progress on sustainable development, and I'm very glad many of the earlier speakers talked about it as well, needs progress on both environment and the economics. Both have to come together. And why is that? If you look at poor energy sources, essentially coal-driven sources, uh, people cooking over open fuel, you find that the incidence of health is really quite large, negative incidence. Eleven times more people in low human developed countries die from indoor pollution than people elsewhere. So the burden of poor conditions is borne mostly by poor communities and poor countries. And this is why I think the Secretary General's initiative is really quite important, which is to have a billion people get access to modern energy services. So that once in, in the next 10, 20, 15 years, we can move out of this, then why is it that the poor people do not have universal access, do not have the same access to electrification, to renewable energy, and things like that. It is essentially about capabilities, about empowering people and reducing their insecurities. Let me go back. Uh, this year, uh, there's an uh, Africa Human Development Report which has come up on food security. And you find that fundamentally food security issues are man-made. They're fundamentally connected to not necessarily 
overproduction or underproduction, but how we distribute food, how food prices affect uh, people who cannot afford to buy food. And uh, uh, the classic example is, of course, the Bengal famine in the 1930s, which killed almost a million, more than a million people. And that occurred when per capita food availability was quite high. And this is the same true in Africa, that food security exists amid abundant resources. And distribution is a vital issue. So these are man-made issues. If there's a problem, we can solve it. Of course, we're talking about demography. Um, by 2050 in Africa, for instance, uh, the billion people now are going to increase to two billion people. And the projections we have made in my office show that actually poverty will increase unless we take drastic immediate action on, particularly on education, on empowering people in a way which will do a lot of other things, reduce fertility rates and so on and so forth. Climate change, for instance, the projections are in the next 15, 20 years, unless we do again something quite dramatic, food uh, yields are going to be reduced by 30 to 40 percent. So all these are security threats, far more important than, than threats of uh, perceived national slights. And this gives an opportunity to move to invest in human security. Fundamentally, it requires a couple of things. One is to put people first. And how, how do you do that? You have to, uh, some of the work done again uh, in, the, in, in my office uh, shows that uh, countries who do well in terms of relating to global markets are the countries who invest in their people. So when you invest in health and education and social security and infrastructure, you are empowering people to deal with insecurity and improve their livelihoods. It's a win-win combination which is very profound. The second dimension is, of course, regionalization. There's actually enough money around in the world. This is the, the sad part. There is about uh, $6.8 trillion in foreign exchange reserves in developing countries, three and a half in developed countries, far beyond whatever self-insurance they were originally designed to do. Uh, when, I, when I was heading the UN in China, I was always uh, talking to our Chinese leaders and, 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 and colleagues who, and to make the simple point that the long-term growth rates of China cannot be sustained if neighbors and partners do not benefit. So these resources must be used to improve the lives of other people, neighbors, so that they can in turn become consumers uh, for uh, Chinese products. A third point I wanted to highlight was maybe this time to think about soft borders instead of hard borders. Uh, I was very struck when I was in Central Asia that uh, people who thought they were majorities suddenly became minorities because someone drew the borderline differently. And that's particularly true of the Fergana Valley, where the, suddenly the Kyrgyz population became a minority and felt a bit uneasy and threatened, and there was true of the other, other, others as well. Uh, there are human aspects of people moving back and forth. Families are connected. This is true certainly between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Somehow we have to find a way to accommodate that human yearning for connecting and meeting each other. And communities which have been there for a long period to remain communities. And a final point is to, I was struck by the fact that there was not a lot of uh, debate and discussion about the changing world which we're living in. Actually, we're li living in a historically rapidly changing world. Maybe because we're in it, we don't fully realize it. But the, in the next 15, 20 years, China, India, Brazil are going to be over 50% of the world's output. And never have this happened so quickly. Never has this happened and affected so many people. Uh, another 20 years, um, the middle class, the numbers of people who are considered middle class will be mostly in the south and not in the north. So all this requires strategic thinking about security as well. And I look forward to hearing as well how the private sector will respond to that. But fundamentally, if we look after the people, 
security looks after itself. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, uh, Dr. Malik, for really sharing your valuable experience with the human development reports and putting emphasis on uh, new points, uh, putting people first and um, uh, uh, highlighting the issue of distribution in terms of uh, food, meeting f in food insecurities. Very important points. Uh, thank you indeed. Uh, last but not least, it gives me great pleasure to invite His Excellency Dr. Gianluigi Magri to make his presentation. Thank you. Mrs. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, history demonstrates that the fight for water, food and energy is very old and that men continue this battle. But also that water, food and energy represent important factors in many asymmetric small wars. Today, United Nations strongly emphasize the importance of international collaboration to promote peace and prosperity. President Obama's doctrines declaims the new role of Europe for Mediterranean and Midwest stability. It means a direct military effort, but always with two conditions. First, a multilateral approach, and second, the humanitarian goal to promote democracy, health, and social rights. Italy occupies a unique geographical position in the Mediterranean region, which provides the country with a special strategic value that highlights Italy's political and military role and the importance in the security of NATO's and Europe's software theater. The region, including the Mediterranean as far as the Gulf, Central Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and Turkey, the push in the direction of the Caspian Sea area and Central Asia is seen to be the nerve center of present and future European stability and of Italy's interests. Italy does not see itself acting alone in any regional confrontation, but rather as part of a community of nations acting together to solve the issues and differences that will affect the political and economic stability of Europe, Middle East, Southwest Asia, but also the Maghreb and Gulf, offer major challenges and opportunities for the international community. Indeed, the need to ensure security, energy supply, and the further development of economic and financial activities, along with that of security and stability of this vast region, and the force to counteract illegal immigration and terrorism as well. The political and geostrategic importance of the Middle East and Southwest Asia in order to meet the challenges of security, energy resources and economic potential need a multilateral approach. Middle East and Southwest Asia region represent the so-called wider Mediterranean, which is of fundamental importance. And as you know, Middle East is being interested by instability and various crises that started before the Arab Spring phenomenon that provides additional wealth destabilization in that area. Currently, there are almost 7,000 Italian men and women in operation abroad from Africa to the Balkans and from the Middle East to Asia. Consistent with its tradition of solidarity and its vocation for international dialogue, Italy has always played a highly visible role in this context. Italy has become de facto a producer of security, stability and economic enhancement. The contribution of our defence is very spread out in the world, in particular in the Southwest Asia and in the Middle East, where it is fully involved. Firstly, Afghanistan still remains the largest and most important operation abroad. ISAF is, along with Lebanon, the far more meaningful for the Atlantic Alliance and the United Europe uh, organization, which within is carried out respectively the mission ISAF and UPOL Afghanistan. For energy and food, another important activity in the area of Southwest Asia, particularly in the Indian Ocean and Gulf of Aden, is counter piracy. Maritime piracy is a deadly threat to the lives of all men and women working at sea. It is also a threat to the maritime industry 
and international trade and to the freedom of movement along sea lines of communication. It is, after all, an attack on the global economy, as almost the 80% of global trade is carried out by maritime transportation. This is uh, fundamental, obviously, for food security, but also it's very important for energy. Italy contributes to both NATO's Operation Ocean Shield and U.S. Operation Endeavour Atalanta with naval assets and staff personnel. It is of fundamental importance that we deepen the quality of international security effort against piracy. That said, the threats and consequences of piracy cannot be remedied by military means alone, because piracy is a transnational issue and an international crime. It should be fought through a multidimensional approach, focusing on prevention, diplomacy, deterrence and security. That's the reason why Italy contributes also through its effort in providing high-level training and logistical support and other activities strictly connected with the general context of regional capacity building in the area. For example, with uh, EU Cap Nestor, UTM Somalia, and also for the border security and surveillance. As far as the Middle East uh, crisis, this region is an area associated with dangers and uh, uncertainties. As a consequence, among other different missions under the framework of the European Union, for example, Uber Marafa, smooth but pivotal in terms of political interest, Italy has contributed to the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, since 1979, and is the first contributor to the UNIFIL II since 2006. Now we have Operation Leontin with over 1,100 soldiers. Middle East is a priority, and we act within the European Union to raise the level of men concerning European policies for that region. In particular, we are fully aware that the real problem affecting the Middle East is the Palestinian and Israeli dispute. We do believe that only the final solution to the crisis will finally create the solid base for the stabilization of the entire Middle East region. But uh, as we know, the actual Syria crisis uh, uh, demonstrates that the problem of Mediterranean stability is uh, very wide. And actually, the safety of wider Mediterranean is probably uh, probably needs uh, three underestimated conditions. First, a new stability of North Africa region with more attention to the fast increasing role of China in Africa. Second, a firm position of the international community in the Balkans with more attention to the risk of instability for religious and technical problems. Third, a new perspectives of economic development and democratic stability in the Middle East. Probably this uh, situation represents uh, an uh, urgent step also for the global stability for water, food and energy issues. But the humanitarian, the humanitarian approach uh, wins only with a multifactorial point of view. In the various multilateral frameworks, such as uh, United Nations, NATO, U uh, UE, and uh, OSHA, Italian approach is certainly characterized by synergies and complementaries between the civilian and military dimension of stabilization and peacekeeping operation. The Italian approach is also based on the provision of our ability to assist the maintenance and restoration of local self-government. In this sense, the emphasis of training of local armed forces and policy as well allows the sharing of our learning experience and enhances participation in the mission of the content based on reconstruction of operational capabilities or governance capability building. This activity allows a faster ownership of security policies at the local level. We strongly believe that the local ownership is a winning factor in crisis management and stabilization. In conclusion, from a strategic point of view, water and food security represent a strictly linked approach to reduce the risk of regional instability. But energy is uh, directly, obviously, very important also for Western economies. It needs a region-effective stability. 
Now, for water and food, we observe the increasing force of international cooperation. And for example, in Afghanistan, of the civil and military cooperation, after the Cold War, now we live in the mission era. And I'm not so sure that the future smart defense is so close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Magri, for sharing with us the Italian experience and the Italian involvement in addressing key global security issues. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a most enriching, indeed, um, uh, panel, and we are very grateful for all our guest speakers. And we have very limited time for questions, but I would like to open the floor immediately for questions to be addressed to our distinguished panel. My name is Nikki Zavella. I'm a member of the European Parliament. And being the rapporteur on the energy roadmap for 2050 for the European Union on behalf of the European Parliament, um, Ambassador Marinaki, I have to mention that in the future plans of the energy roadmap of the Union, there are no references to networking or establishing or constructing any pipelines, any routes for energy coming from Central Asia, Central West Asia, and South Asia. With the obsession of uh, the Union on uh, renewables, uh, we focus on renewables and some other sources in Europe. We don't plan anything on energy interconnections with Central Asia, which personally I consider a huge mistake. What do you think about it since you work with the external um, unit? And from what I know, EAS will uh, have the responsibility of energy as well, Baroness Aston. Thank you. If I may, we'll take a few more questions, and then we will we'll request the panel kindly to speak. Hello, Nick Maybe from E3G. I wondered if the panelists could um, just comment on some of the slightly different messages um, they gave on the role of water in conflict, because um, it often comes up that no water has been fought over war, though actually most major river basins are controlled by large countries who were formed probably by the use of armed force. But it just seems to me this is one of these statements which people throw out, and it'd be interesting to see if we could get some resolution of the different framing on the panel. Thank you. Any other questions at this moment? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Javella, for, uh, for your question. Um, well, uh, the, the, the issue of energy responsibilities uh, is, uh, as we understand, a quite uh, shared one and a quite expansive one because definitely the Commission has the lead and Commissioner Oettinger is the one in the leadership. Um, from our part, from the part of the External Action Service and the High Representative, the element that uh, we would like to, to, to bring to, to, to the overall perception of uh, the energy policies has to do with the additional contribution of uh, on the external aspects of uh, strategic value that feed into the wider discussion. So by no means will the external action service substitute the commission which has and will continue to do so have the lead on, on the energy issue. Um, referring to the expansion and uh, uh, overall uh, um, review of the networks to connect uh, Central Asia with, uh, with Europe. Um, I understand this is an issue that it is pretty much under consideration. And uh, uh, to this, we try, from, uh, from our point of view, to contribute to the discussion, uh, bringing forward what should be a preemptive, uh, let's say, approach on conflict resolution in the region that would affect 
um, the way energy has been uh, uh, circulated. And in this sense, uh, I understand that the first discussion that has taken place at the Foreign Affairs Council of last July, where both uh, Commissioner Oettinger and uh, High Representative Ashton participated, what has come out clearly from the member states' foreign ministers had to do with uh, the issues that need to be identified uh, that would need uh, a further consideration. And what you indicate is definitely among the priorities in this respect. So I understand that this is uh, far from being resolved. It's an issue that it is still uh, very much in the forefront of the priorities for all ministers. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Malik, may I ask you to uh, perhaps reply to the second question since you ma raised the point about the uh, no wars over water? Yeah, I think it's always good to throw a provocative statement just to see if people are paying attention huh? or not. Huh? Uh, I think the point being made was actually a more serious point, which is that water is absolutely essential to life. And it's also a great opportunity to foster shared cooperation because that is what really has to drive uh, the fuller utilization of water uh, because it affects people's livelihoods in a very direct and basic way. I'll give you another aspect of that. Uh, surveys on, uh, on the Pakistani Taliban uh, show that at least 70 percent of the young men who are part of the Pakistani Taliban are doing it for jobs. So economic issues, economic factors are central to the notion of security. We have looked at security the other way around. We looked at security in terms of armies and, and, and guns and, and armaments, where in, if you look at historically and you look at all the deeper analysis on these things, it's very rare do you see that wars actually produce peace necessarily. I mean, of course, there are certain issues which have come up and you have to uh, take, on, take on more militaristic means. But the more enduring forms of uh, peace and stability is to invest in people fundamentally, and that's the point uh, of the presentation. Thanks. In concluding this session, I would like uh, on all our behalf to reiterate our thanks and appreciation to our distinguished panel of guest speakers who really addressed the questions of this important plenary session. Thank you indeed all very much. Thank you.